technology is being a little cruel. I'm sure it'll open in a minute. So I'll introduce our next speaker. And it is, it's a What Happened Next. Um, and we're going to hear about Richard Boyle's son, which is fantastic. So, and, uh, and the speaker is Dr Patrick Little, who studied at the universities of Cambridge, Dublin and London, and is a senior research fellow at the History of Parliament Trust in London. He has published widely on 17th century British and Irish history, and his books include Lord Brohill and the Cromwellian Union in Ireland, with Ireland and Scotland, by, published by Boyd Allen Brewer in 2004, and he's currently working on an edition of the Second Earl of Cork's Diary, 1650 to 1676, and a study of the Church of Ireland, 1641 to 1660. So, well, thank you very much. And while Danielle's setting setting things up, um, just to say that this paper is, it is sort of part two, and it's very much starting with the great Earl of Cork, and how he made the Boyles respectable. So we've heard about the very disrespectful uh, way that he got his land. What did he do with it then? Because you've amassed a huge estate, and possibly the obvious thing to do is to give it to your only son, or your, your, your son and heir, but he doesn't do that. He sets up a dynasty. So he wants all his children to share in the spoils, but he also wants them to be uh, acceptable socially, um, in, not just in Ireland, but in England as well. And I've... Any second there? Any second there. I've just got, got a, a few um, pictures of some of the protagonists, so it's not, it's not all singing and dancing like, like, like Dave's thing. But, uh, and the title that I sort of came up with was... Respective, kind and loving, the Boyle family during the Interregnum and the Restoration. Sorry. There they are. That's it. So there's the man in later life. This is Lord Treasurer's staff. The Great Earl of Cork loved to tell people what to do. I think we've already established that. And in his will, written in November 1642, a year after the outbreak of the Rising which had turned Ireland upside down, the Earl looked forward to a time of peace and prosperity in which his extensive landed estates could be safely divided between his four surviving sons and generous provision made for his daughters, grandchildren and other more distant relatives. The legal clauses were reinforced by moral and religious strictures, and his will is one of the longest I've ever seen. It's the, the detail is incredible, and it's quite rambling. And at one point, Cork urged his son and heir, Viscount Dungarvan, to fulfil the terms of the will, as he intends the salvation of his own soul and his honour, reputation and conscience, both with God and man in this world and the world to come. He warned Dungarvan and the trustees of the estate that they will answer the neglect or breach of this, my great trust, will and testament, before God at the dreadful day of judgment. The Earl finished his will with a further decree, and this is the thing I'm really concentrating on, that my said three younger sons be and continue observant, respective, kind and loving unto their elder brother, and that he will be helping, comfortable and assistant unto them and they lodged and entertained by and with him in his house in Dublin, when their several occasions draw them thither, and that all his younger brethren do hearken unto, incline and follow all such good counsel and advice as he from time to time shall give them. The great Earl expected his elder son, Viscount Dungarvan, who would succeed him as second Earl of Cork, to care for his siblings and their families as his own. And in return, the other members of the family were to work together under Dungarvan's leadership. In short, the Boyles were to act as a team. In this paper, I shall consider how far the children of the first Earl fulfilled their father's wishes. The focus will be on the 20 years after the old man's death in 1643, as the Boyles faced the dangers of warfare, the upheavals of Cromwellian rule, and the treacherous waters of the Restoration. First, some introductions. The great Earl of Cork, 15 children, and unusually, 11 of them survived into adulthood. 
there were five boys. Richard Viscount Dungarvan, and that's him. That's a fairly young man there. I'm not sure when that was when it was painted. Maybe in the early 1650s. And as you see, he's fairly nicely dressed, lovely dressing gown. Well, it's not a dressing gown. <laughs> and, but with, with a real sort of sense of presence. But interestingly, not in armour. He's the eldest son. He was a solid, dutiful character whose attention to detail when it came to managing the family estates was second only to that of his father. His priorities, according to one historian, were land, family and loyalty to the crown. And what he lacked in guile and subtlety, he made up in unremitting application. So he's a bit of a plodder. He's not really like his father. He's not a sort of swashbuckling um, Elizabethan character at all. He married in 1634 the only daughter of the English peer, Lord Clifford, acquiring in the process considerable estates in Yorkshire. The second son, Lewis Viscount Kinnelmeaky, I haven't got a, a picture of him, became a dashing soldier and died in battle in 1642. His wife was a lady of the royal court, Elizabeth Fielding, daughter of the Earl of Denbigh, and related to the Dukes of Buckingham. Roger, Lord Brockhill, there he is, that's from 1660. If you notice he's already adopted the restoration fashion of a very big wig. And he's, uh, you can't really see it there, but he's dressed in armour as befitted uh, quite a famous soldier by this stage. Here's the third son. He was another military man, but was more famous as a politician, being described by a recent authority as an adept of intrigue and cajolery and a superlative political fixer. But he was also an, un he was an accomplished author who, after the Restoration, produced a number of works for the stage and also a military manual. So again, with the Boyles, you have this sort of strange mixture of someone who was a soldier and a politician, but also had a certain refined and intellectual edge. And Brockhill married the daughter of the Earl of Suffolk, so he did pretty well as well. Francis Boyle came fourth, and that's, he must have been a very young, young man then, teenager. So that's probably from the mid-1630s, perhaps in conjunction with his grand tour, or maybe with his marriage in 1639. And he, he's the fourth son. He married a lady at court, Elizabeth Killigrew. And the fifth and final son the most famous today, was Robert Boyle, a famous scientist who never married. And that's a, a, a portrait after the Restoration. He's the Boyle of Boyle's Law and one of the uh, founders of modern chemistry. The Boyle sisters were equally successful in their own ways. And one of the interesting things about uh, the great Earl of Cork is he invested an awful lot in the education and um, upbringing of his daughters, which is quite unusual. Alice was very much the oldest. She was the, the first child to survive. And her marriage to the Earl of Barrymore was the first step in her father's strat strategy of making alliances with the Old English, the Munster. Her sister Sarah married Robert Lord Digby, the son and heiress... Sorry? No, that's wrong. <laughs> The, who, was, who was the son of the heiress of the Kildare estates, the redoubtable Lady Offaly. And Lady Offaly is a very interesting, strong woman char character. Of this. I mean, she defended her castle against um, the uh, Irish Catholic forces in, in 1642. And to my amusement in the uh, uh, Great Earl's diary, she played cards with him and won. <laughs> The third daughter, Joan, seemed to have scooped the jackpot by marrying the 16th Earl of Kildare, known as the Fairy Earl. Although it soon became clear that Kildare was a proud, dissolute spendthrift who's point, who point-blank refused to accept the advice of his father-in-law. So Kildare and Cork didn't get on at all. Cork had spent lavishly on acquiring these marriages for his daughters, not least in buying back mortgaged estates and rebuilding ancestral seats. So to an extent, I mean, to move on to what David was saying, the, um, the money is sort of reinvested into the old families, 
but of course on, on court's terms. They have to be loyal to the Crown, they have to be, the heirs have to be brought up as Protestants, they have to do as he tells them to. The Kildare Castle at Maynooth was remodelled under his guidance, and the Barrymore seat at Castle Lyons was also restored. The younger daughters were provided with suitable husbands from the Irish Protestant community. Catherine, who's there, uh, soon gained the reputation of being the most renowned female intellectual of her generation, <coughs> becoming a friend of poets such as John Milton and Andrew Marvell, Republicans like Sir Henry Vane the Younger, and scientists including Samuel Hartlib, William Petty and Robert Hooke. She married Arthur Jones, son of Cork's political ally, Viscount Ranella, and her sister Dorothy, Oh yes, uh, married Arthur Loftus, son of another associate, Sir Adam Loftus. So there were these people within the new English administration. Mary, here you go, was the youngest and the only child to rebel. This is a portrait of her in early middle age. Beautiful and vivacious, she married for love against her father's wishes. Although the bridegroom Charles Rich, younger son of the Earl of Warwick, was hardly an unwelcome addition to the family. And indeed, he himself became Earl of Warwick before the Restoration. After a frivolous girlhood, Mary repented and became known for her piety. She was very puritanical. <laughs> and not all of these siblings play a, a leading role in what follows. And the focus is on the ones I've shown you. And go back a bit. There we go. Dungarvan. Rockhill, Francis, and Robert, and also Alice, um, Lady Barrymore, and I don't have a, a picture of her, Catherine Jones, Lady Ranelagh, and to a lesser extent, Mary, later Countess of Warwick. With all these children to provide for, it was perhaps just as well that the great earl as a self-made man was not bound by complicated entails or other legal devices that would tie up the estates of a member of an ancient family and ensure that the patrimony went to the eldest son. As you see, in he acquired all these estates. He didn't inherit anything. So he was more or less free to settle the lands as he chose. And he took full advantage of this freedom. In 1636, drawing up a very complicated indenture which parcelled his lands out among his five sons. The daughters obviously were provided for with marriage portions, so they would get, well, £5,000 or something like that when they married, and that would be invested in land. So it's always back to land with Cork. So Kinalmeaky was to inherit estates in West Cork with a house at Band and, and additional lands at Gill Abbey near the Cork city. Rockhill would receive lands in and around Mallow, as well as estates in counties Kerry and Limerick, notably uh, Askeaton Castle. Francis's estates were concentrated in East Cork, while Robert had lands at Mallow and further afield in counties Tipperary, Clare, Wexford and Kildare. Dungarvan would receive the lion's share in counties Cork and Waterford, centred on Lismore Castle and the College at Yore. These were added to his wife's inheritance made of extensive, this is um, Dungarvan's wife, who had extensive estates in Yorkshire. The terms of the indenture were revised after Kinalmeaky's death in battle in 1642, with his lands being divided up amongst the younger sons. And by this stage, the great earl had also acquired his own property in England, Stalbridge in Dorset, which went to Robert, and Marston Beggart in Somerset, which went to Broghill. And by distributing his lands between the five sons and endowing his daughters with considerable wealth in cash, Cork was intent on founding a series of closely interlocked dynasties, each with the wherewithal to support a peerage, and that's the important thing. They must all be nobles, whether it's in England or in Ireland. It was an audacious plan, and one that had been very carefully thought out. It also complemented the lesson he'd been dinning into his children from an early age, that to prosper, the Boyles had to work together. The demands made in the will were not new. The Great Earl had long been keen to promote family unity. And this sometimes took a symbolic form. The elaborate funeral of his Countess, who died in 1630, demanded a full turnout of Boyle relatives and retainers, 
with the five Boyle daughters resident in Ireland, forming the chief mourning party. The ornate tomb erected for the Countess in St Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, many of you will be familiar with that. That's only a bit of it, it keeps going. <laughs> and I think what you've got there is, you've got the daughters, and then you've got the sons, in, all in their um, robes of nobility. And then at the top there are the um, ancestors. So it's the, his, it's the, the, his wife's ancestors, not his. So that included not only the statues of the island countess, but of all the Boyle children, each with the appropriate coat of arms. So you can't see that there. Anyway, um, the Great Earl's diary in the 1630s gives the impression that he was anxious to bring together members of the ex extended family as often as, he, as often as he possibly could. And in his many journeys around Ireland, he made a point of taking as many of his family as he could, an entourage and especially his most impressive Irish sons-in-law, the Earls of Kildare and Barrymore and Lord Digby of Geishill, along with him, to cite but two examples. When Cork left, Cork left for England in July 1638, he travelled with the Earl and Countess of Barrymore and Kildare's eldest son, and a year later he visited the Earl of Bristol in Dorset, and he brought with him Brockhill, Kinelmeaky, Barrymore and Arthur Jones. I think you can see why sometimes the sons-in-law got fed up with him, because he was, they were on parade, they were on show. Bonds between individuals are strengthened by educational arrangements made for them. As a young man, Dungarvan was sent to France, where he visited Paris, and studied at the Huguenot Academy at Saumur, where he was taught by eminent Protestant scholars. The success of this trip encouraged the great Earl to send Broghill and Kinelmeaky, fresh from Trinity College Dublin, on an extended journey which included visits to northern Italy and Geneva and a longer spell at Samoa. And they in turn were followed by Francis and Robert, who had already spent many years together at Eton College and now embarked on an extensive tour of the continent. Now these grand tours, of course, were newly fashionable. This was the way of the, the great nobility in England and increasingly in Ireland of the adding a cultural polish, really. They would learn languages, they would also have, um, I mean, they, they would learn from masters of fencing and horsemanship, as well as studying with the great Protestant theologians. It's interesting that, uh, you know, Dungarvan wasn't allowed anywhere near Italy, but uh, the younger sons were, but they weren't allowed to go to Rome. And they had a, these tours generally had a decidedly religious motive. The Great Earl was a sincere Calvinist, though loyal to the Church of Ireland, and he provided suitable, suitably pious tutors for his children and encouraged their studies abroad and at home. And what the arrangements for the, fa the household were also quite interesting. The family observed twice daily prayers and Sunday sermons and were ministered to by a range of godly chaplains and visitors, including the learned Archbishop of Armagh, James Usher. And the impact on the children of this was quite profound. The second Earl of Cork employed a number of different clergymen in the 1650s, and was punctilious in his private devotions, as well as his attendance at the public service of God, often in company of one, with one or more of his siblings. The Barrymores were said to have heard sermons twice a day, Sundays, Wednesdays and Fridays, at their house at Castle Lyons. And the three-cornered correspondence between Robert Boyle, Lady Ranelagh and Mary Rich was imbued with personal piety. Worship was underpinned with theological reflection. Lady Ranelagh, who was a fan of French and Dutch Protestant ideas, sent her own sons off to Samoa in the late 1650s, and they were followed by the sons of Lord Broghill. Mary Rich, in her autobiography, remembered how her enthusiasm for fashion and the theatre had been quashed in the later 1640s by my Lord Primate of Ireland's preaching. And Brockhill also maintained a close friendship with Archbishop Usher later in his career. So an atmosphere of Calvinist confidence surrounded the Boyle siblings' years. This is perhaps the counterpart of what David is saying. That on the one hand, he's the robber baron. On the other hand, he's the godly magistrate. This is exactly what their father had hoped for. Not for nothing did he choose, as a family motto, 
God's providence is our inheritance. So cut something to conjure with. <laughs> Military service gave the Boyles a shared experience of another kind. Although the first bishops' war mounted by Charles I against the rebellious Scots in 1639 was a bit of a non-event, there was no major battle, it was, there was a skirmish, it provided a welcome opportunity for the youngsters to show off. Dungarvan raised a troop of horse from the family estates in Munster. Of course, it's easy to do that because you've got the militia captains there, you've got the muster rolls, you know who to take with you on this jolly. Barrymore recruited officers in Ireland to command a regiment of foot that was actually raised in Wales, and Brockhill and Kinnelmeaky were provided with horses and armour to join in the fun. This is much more of a pageant than a, a, a serious military engagement. Arthur Jones, another son-in-law, also planned to join the King in the North, though he didn't get any further than London. And the Earl of Kildare, ever ready to please, made a fool of himself by boasting at court that he would offer his prince thousands of Irish, and he says they shall all be Geraldines. Nothing happened. With the outbreak of rebellion across Ireland in 1641, the Boyles were able to share a military adventure of a more serious kind. The Catholic insurgents soon hemmed in the Protestant settlers of Munster into a pocket in eastern County Cork and parts of Waterford, with refugees and inhabitants forming regiments of their own and defending castles and towns, including York and Lismore. And at the Battle of Liscarroll in 1642, when a Confederate Catholic field army was defeated by the Protestants under Lord Inchiquin, who was, um, despite his Gaelic upbringing, was a Protestant commander, Dungarvan, Kinnelmeaky, Brochel and Francis Boyle and their brother-in-law Barrymore all distinguished themselves much to their father's delight. But Liscarroll also brought tragedy to the family, for Kinnelmeaky was killed in action and the Earl of Barrymore was mortally wounded. He died shortly afterwards. In the early days, the interaction between the members of the Boyle family had been staged managed by the Great Earl. But it is interesting that after his death in September 1643, relationships between his children and their spouses continued to prosper. There were obvious tensions between individual family members, but these were caused by immediate political differences or geographical separation rather than personal animosity. To take but one example, it was not surprising that there was very little contact between, for example, the Royalist Second Earl of Cork, who spent much of his time with the King in Oxford before going to France in exile, and Lord Broghill, who was deeply involved with the existential struggle of the Protestant forces in Munster. The Munster Protestants were aligned with Parliament until Inchiquin's defection to the King in 1648, when Broghill went to England in disgust. Although the family was divided, the doors to reconciliation were still open, in some cases, literally. An inventory of the Second Earl's Mansion, Cork House in Dublin, made in November 1645, shows that chambers were still set aside for Dorothy Loftus and the Countess of Kildare, while the young Lord Digby, whose father had been killed in 1642, so there's now the nephew rather than the brother-in-law, was allowed a storeroom there. That is exactly the kind of arrangement the Great Earl had laid down in his will when he told his son and heir to make sure the whole family should be lodged and entertained by and with him in his house in Dublin. The itinerary of Robert Boyle during 1648 and 1649 also shows the coherence of the family despite rising political tensions in England and Ireland. In February 1648, Robert went to Holland with his brother Francis, but he'd returned to England by August when he was staying with his sister, Mary Rich, in Essex. And in March 1649, he was with Broghill at his house in Somerset. In early August, just before Cromwell's arrival in Ireland, Robert Boyle wrote to Lady Ranler from Bath, explaining that he'd recently been troubled with visits of a quotidian ague, which is a sort of fever that repeats every day, which had, not yet, which had yet not the power to hinder me from three or four journeys to serve Frank, this is Brother Francis, and wait and wait upon my dear Brockham. Robert Boyle's visits to his sibling, siblings had an under, underlying political purpose, for he and Lady Randler seem to have been instrumental in persuading Brockhill to throw in his lot with Oliver Cromwell. 
It was perhaps appropriate that to persuade him, they first had to engage in a tug of war with royalist members of the family, notably, notably Lord Cork, who was now in exile in France, and Francis Boyle in Holland. But also the widowed Lady Kinomiki, who did their, all did their best to win their brother or brother-in-law for the king before it was too late. The success of the parliamentarian members of the family led to Broghill agreeing to support Cromwell in Ireland, and he was crucial in securing the defection of the Protestant garrisons from the royalist side in the autumn of 1649. Cromwell's brutal reconquest of Ireland took only a matter of months, and in its aftermath, the Boyles were left to salvage something of their inheritance from the smouldering ruins. Key to this was securing permission for the Lord Cork, as head of the family, to return from exile without fear for his safety. So that's the, just the two brothers who will feature in the next section. In this, the siblings who had sided with Cromwell played a very important role. In January 1651, the Countess of Cork's agent in England reported that her husband's interests had been served beyond expectation by your sister Ranella and your brother Robert, brothers Robert and Roger. Broghill's influence with Cromwell was perhaps the most useful to the Corks, and this is hinted at by a letter from the Countess later in the same year thanking him for allowing her husband to return to England and reassuring him that my brother Broghill was therewith acquainted. Lord Cork was back in Munster in May 1651, where he met Broghill and their nephew, the young Earl of Barrymore, at Yore, before moving on to the Barrymore House at Castle Lyons and then to Broghill's recently acquired state, estate at Blarney, which was taken from the McCarthys. In July, the brothers travelled on to Bandon and then to Kilmallock before visiting Cromwell's son-in-law, Henry Ireton, who was with the Cromwellian army besieging Limerick, and then they returned to Cork in early November. Now, this itinerary, which took in the western half of the traditional Boyle area of influence, gave notice to tenants and to neighbours that the Boyle family were back in town. It demonstrated also to the military governors, to the Cromwellians, that Cork and Brochel were the best of friends. As their father had realised, such displays of unity were important in maintaining the family's power in Ireland. The hard work had only just begun, however, for there was as yet little prospect that the second Earl's extensive estates could be prized from the hands of the Cromwellian state before they were handed out to soldiers and civilian adventurers who all expected a share of the spoils. Now the Irish rising had been crushed. Because early on there was an adventurous scheme which basically said to London merchants, they were mostly London merchants, you give us money to reconquer Ireland and you will get estates confiscated from the Irish Catholics. And of course the army were then included in that scheme, which is why you had that massive redistribution of Irish lands in the 1650s. And people like the established settlers, particularly those who had been royalists, were extremely vulnerable in this because they thought that they were secure. And then Cromwell came along and suddenly they were, they were on, the, um, on the losing side. Now, Cork was evidently a persuasive man. And by August 1651, he'd managed to get the sequestration of his lands in County Court lifted after an interview with the military governor. But in October, the parliamentary commissioners issued a further order confiscating all the lands of former royalists. At first, Broghill had high hopes that Ireton would intervene, but then he died in November, still besieging Limerick, and instead Broghill had to visit the commissioners himself, pointing out that their order contravened the earlier articles of war that had been signed by many of the royalists when Ormond surrendered Dublin in 1647. And such arguments put the commissioners on the back foot and they were forced to make concessions. In January 1652, they allowed Cork to enjoy the profits of his lands for two years. So this is the sort of thin end of the wedge. That's what, what the Boyles are hoping. You get temporary custody of the lands. It means it's much more difficult for people to take them away. And after the arrival of Charles Fleetwood as a new general to replace Ireton, Cork, supported by Broghill, took his case to the Court of Articles, which in January 1653 allowed him to compound, which is paying a big fine in return for the restoration of the estates. 
Broghill's tireless and successful campaign on his brother's behalf demonstrates the sense of collective responsibility within the family had survived the divisions of the Irish wars. Now, as Lord Broghill's political career took off, first as the leader of the Irish Party in the Union Parliament of 1654, <coughs> then as President of, the, of Cromwell's Council in Scotland from March 1655, and finally as one of those who engineered the offer of the Crown to Cromwell during the spring of 1657, he, he was a fan of Cromwell, he was forced to be absent from Ireland for long periods. The second Earl of Court stayed in Ireland, however, and acted as his brother's political fixer in both Munster and Dublin. This can be seen in the parliamentary elections to the Union Parliament in 1654 and 1656. Now, the parliaments of this period included 30 Irish MPs, and three of these were returned from seats in County Court. There's the county seat itself, and then there were two combined boroughs, borough seats, Bandon and Kinsale, and Cork and Yaw. And in 1654, all three MPs were returned on the Boyle ticket. Boghill sat for the county himself, while other seats went to friends and neighbours. There's William Jefferson of Mallow, and, William, and uh, Vincent Gookin, whose family held estates near Cork McSherry. Lord Cork's role in this is revealed in his diaries. In July 1654, a few days before the election, the Earl visited Bandon, where he was attended by the Provost and the Burgesses, who asked for his preferences for the election. As the Earl recorded, I did the day after, did choose and nominated Mr Vincent Gookin, whom they afterwards, upon my desire, did choose. So the elections were a lot more straightforward in those days. I mean, you didn't, didn't bother asking the electorate. But well, it was an electorate, but um, obviously they, they were um, overawed by uh, the Lord Cork and all his entourage arriving in town and saying, mm, I have that one. <laughs> Presumably, the Earl could count on similar support in his hometown of York. And his influence in Cork was quite great as well. We don't have the evidence for that. <coughs> but Boyle influence is confirmed by the names of the electors recorded on the surviving election indentures for the borough. And for that of the county election, both held at the beginning of August. And they were signed by a large number of Boyle tenants. So, you, know, you choose your people, and then you encourage your, your um, tenants and friends to turn out. And perhaps you might have a word with a few people who don't want to turn up. That's, perhaps he learned that from his father. And the next sex, set of elections in August 1656 saw the return of the same slate of MPs, and the Earl's diary shows a busy round of visits and entertainments strongly suggestive of lobbying for support, with Lord Cork making a point of dropping in on old allies such as Sir William Fenton of Mitchellstown and Francis Falk at Camphire, if you pronounce it like that, to ensure that his men were elected to the three seats. This democracy in action. And during the Parliament's parliamentary session that followed, the Earl of Cork visited Dublin twice, in November and December 1656, and in April and May 1657. And he frequently waited on the acting Governor of Ireland, the Protector's younger son, Henry Cromwell. These were not social occasions, primarily. On the 11th of November 1656, for example, Lord Cork recorded, I supped privately with my Lord Cromwell, and had much discourse in private about Broghill. On the 3rd of December, the two met again, with Henry Cromwell confiding that he could not decide whether to go to London or not. It was Broghill who engaged him coming over, and that if left him now in the sudden and came not over to assist him, he was to blame. And again in April 1657, Cork dined with Henry and had some discourse about the public. Now these are only hints and suggestions, but I think they are very important ones show that Cork went to Dublin when Broghill needed him to. These meetings were vitally important in coordinating the efforts not only of Broghill but also of the 30 Irish MPs whose willingness to support the Boyles as a bloc against the army interest in Parliament was one of the defining features of this, of this Parliament. And the relationship with Broghill was not unique amongst the Boyles. Lord Cork was the pivotal figure in keeping the extended family together in what was a very difficult period. His diaries contain numerous accounts of family visits, details of letters written and agreements made. The Loft of Farnham, that might like a picture of Athlarnham Castle. 
uh, for example, remained an important part of the social circle. In October 1653, Lady Loftus and her daughter visited Broghill's ca castle at Bla Blarney before transferring to Lismore. Broghill and Sir Arthur Loftus visited Cork in January 1654, and in November 1656, Cork, Lady Ranelagh, and the Earl of Kildare's sister, Lady Shane, stayed with the Loftuses at Rathfarnham. Less happily, in December 1658, Cork recorded that he had spent much of this afternoon in composing some differences between Sir Arthur Loftus and his wife. <laughs> Alice, Dowager Countess of Barrymore, was also very co close to the Corks. In January 1654, Lady Barrymore visited this moor. I've had a picture of that already. Where Cork and Broghill did advise her to put away her servant, James Savage, for some reasons we offered her of, which she did approve. Now, this is the problem with the diary, you get snippets, mm -hmm. and you just uh, read between the lines, you think, ah, OK. We don't know what Savage's fault was, but the brothers' intervention suggests a very close acquaintance with their sister's household affairs. And this is confirmed by an incident a year later. In April 1655, Cork went from Lismore to Bandon, and on the way stayed overnight at Castle Lyons, where I reconciled my Lord of Barrymore and his lady to my sister, that's the Dowager Countess, and prevailed with her that for a time they should have their diet in her house. In other words, that she should feed them, entertain them. Clearly there was some sort of dispute. Perhaps the young couple felt that there, there was a nice you know, dower house somewhere that she could live in rather than sitting in Castle Lyons. That was the compromise, maybe. The Fitzgeralds were also in need of timely interventions by the head of the family. The dissolute 16th Earl of Kildare had always been unstable, but towards the end of his life, relations between him and the Boyles seemed to have collapsed altogether. Now, just as a tangent, that's the gate of Maynooth Castle, a bit of a ruin, rebuilt by the great Earl of Cork. I, I tried blowing this up, it didn't work on this picture, but this thing on the medieval gatehouse, that was erected by the first Earl of Cork. It's the Boyle arms with the arms of the Fitzgeralds just to say I rebuilt this for you. He also drew up an extraordinary, I wish I had a, a picture of it in 1632, an extraordinary um, illustrate, uh, illuminated pedigree of the Fitzgeralds which he presented to his new son-in-law the Earl of Kildare with a preface that says basically you have illustrious ancestors, you've got a lot to live up to but now you've got, you're married into the Boyle family, all this can come true and this is where your family comes from and this is how they're interrelated to the Boyle family and not just the main line of the Kildares, Barrymore is on there and so is Lord Digby Anyway, in November 1656, Lord Cork and Lady Ranelagh and Lord Kildare's brother-in-law, Captain Shane, petitioned the Irish Council for an order to restrain the Earl from selling off his estate. A month later, Cork dropped in on Kil Kildare at his house at Kilkey, where I found him in bed, his whore being newly gone from him, and though I used all arguments I could to persuade him to settle his estate, yet I could prevail nothing. I mean, the moral indignation is just dripping from that. And to everyone's relief, the wayward Earl of Kildare died soon afterwards and was succeeded by his much more malleable son. The estate was immediately pounced on and put into the hands of reliable trustees, including a number of, of uh, the Boyle family. I mean, not letting that happen again. So, as a guide, a reconciler, and a constrainer of the awkward and the obstinate. The second Earl of Cork was acting very much as the great Earl would have wanted. It is interesting to note that Lord Cork, like his father, was well aware of the importance of publicity and made a point of travelling with an entourage of relatives as in May and September 1657 when the young Earl of Kildare joined another nephew, Lord Digby of Geeshill, Lady Ranelagh and Lord and Lady Broghill in excursions to and from Dublin. I mean, if you're the head of the Boyle family, you don't go anywhere on your own or with just a few servants. You take everybody with you. And I suppose it's also a bit cheaper that way, because whoever you land on then has to pay the bill. 
The, hor the strong horizontal relations between the second Earl of Cork and his immediate family and the efforts made to incorporate the younger generation into the affinity had done much to ensure that the Boyles had recovered from the devastation of war and the risk of confiscation by the end of the 1650s. But this recovery was put into jeopardy by political events beyond the Irish Sea. We do not know Lord Cork's reaction to the death of Oliver Cromwell on the 3rd of September 1658, but other members of the family were aghast. Cromwell, for all his many faults, had been someone the Irish Protestant community, and especially the Boyles, could do business with. Cromwell's concessions on land questions earlier in the decade, his willingness to rehabilitate former royalists, and his ability to rein in and at times viciously curb the more radical army officers, all were vital for the survival of men like Lord Cork. Lady Ranelagh, who of all the siblings was perhaps the most sympathetic to republican ideals, admitted not to have received the news of His Highness's death unmovedly. I do not doubt his loss will be a growing affliction upon these nations, and that we shall learn to value him more by missing him. She may have been voicing a general feeling among the Boyles, including those royalists who had become reconciled to the new regime. I should point out that Cromwell in 1658 was a very different Cromwell from 1649. As head of state, he found that compromises need to be made, and concessions even to the Irish. That's not much comfort to the Catholics, but it's something that the Protestants could work with in their usual pragmatic way. Richard Cromwell, who succeeded his father as Lord Protector, was tumble down Dick. He didn't last long, and he wasn't a man to inspire the feelings that his father had. And it was not long before the radical elements in the army... Oh, I've got that... Lost again. It was probably Cromwell this time. And it was not long before the radical elements of the army were causing political instability across the three nations. The change of... Oh. I'm not sure. Is it the chair's job to swap wasps? It is it? Oh, is. Right. is it? I don't know. It's gone. The change of regime certainly un unsettled the Protestants in Munster. This can be seen in the elections for the new parliament, which met in January 1659. Instead of a cosy consensus, carefully brokered by the diplomatic Earl of Cork, the elections in County Cork were fraught. The key problem was the increasingly erratic behaviour of Vincent Gookin. Gookin had been a political client of the Boyles, but he was not their tenant. At least I don't think he was their tenant. Uh, his family, um, I mean, he was the younger son, so he was a, a, perhaps he was emulating the great Earl in his own way. Anyway, Gookin had ambitions to extend his own property in East Cork, and this led to conflict with the Barrymores in particular. And as the elections approached, it became clear that Gookin was intent on standing against the Boyles at the combined constituency of Cork and Yule. This challenge caused, called for direct action by, by the Boyles. And here we get a bit of a shade of the Great Earl coming out. On the 15th of January, Lord Cork and Lord Brockhill met at the latter's house at Ballymaloo to discuss the forthcoming elections. On the following day, Brockhill wrote to his brother with news that he had received assurances of support from the Corporation of Yule and tended to travel to Cork in person. That if I come myself, I need not doubt but to carry it. There's a certain of the great old swagger there. As a precaution, the sermons in each borough, customary held before the elections, were preached by ministers associated with the Boyle family. On the day of the election, Brockhill went to Cork, where his supporters protested against Gookin and cried up the rival candidate, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Falk. It's another Boyle friend. And in the face of such direction, a direct action, Falk was duly elected by both boroughs without six negatives. So being able to overawe the Burgesses in these boroughs, it's clearly a tactic that worked. The Boyles also put forward Admiral William Penn as their candidate for the seat of Bandon and Kinsale. This was a direct challenge to Vincent Gookin, who had represented the seat in the previous two parliaments, and now planned to have his own friend, the surveyor, Dr William Petty, elected instead. Gookin told the Burgesses of Bandon and Kinsale that he had the support of the Dublin government as well as the Boyles, a claim that enraged Broghill, who accused Gookin of having played the knave egregiously and immediately called upon all his friends and supporters to oppose Gookin's party. And for once, it didn't work. 
Boker was unsuccessful, and when Petty stood aside, he had in the interim been elected for a Cornish seat, Gukin took his place with the support of the Kinsale Corporation and was elected as MP. Hmm. Richard Cromwell's Parliament did nothing to calm the radicals within the army, and the session was forced to close in April 1659 after an intervention by the senior officers, and in a matter of weeks, the same firebrands had brought about the end of the protectorate itself. The restored Commonwealth was unstable and unpopular, and Broghill retreated to Ireland to await events. In December, he joined other Irish Protestants in mounting a coup of their own, seizing Dublin Castle and other strong points across Ireland, and making contact with General George Monk and others who were mounting resistance to the extremists elsewhere in the British Isles. Broghill became a crucial figure in the General Convention, the quasi-Parliament that met in Dublin, where he commanded a retinue of Boyle clients who represented Munster's seat. So he was back in the driving seat, and Gookin, by the way, had died the previous year, so he was out. And in the meantime, the Earl of Cork had crossed to London, where he soon met up with members of the family in the capital. In January 1660, he dined with Lady Ranella and Robert Boyle, with whom he consulted about my brother Brockhill's affairs. And on a less harmonious occasion in March, he met Robert Boyle, the Earl of Kildare, and Captain Shane about the settlement of my Lord Kildare's estate. Yep. Although the young Earl was less volatile than his father, this meeting ended with violence, as my Lord Kildare, this is, struck at Captain Shane, who did the like to him. So I can't imagine anyone resorting to fisticuffs in front of the Great Earl. I think that would be ill-advised. You might find a horse's head in your bed the next day. <laughs> As the spring continued and the restoration of the Stuart monarchy became more likely, Lord Cork acted as Broghill's eyes and ears in London. He visited General Monk and dined with other influential politicians and wrote numerous letters to Broghill with detailed information of the state of play. Broghill was in contact with the Royalists through, also in contact with the Royalists through his sister-in-law, Lady Gilgamekey, and through his brother Francis Boyle, now, Fr now Viscount Shannon, who was also resident with the royal court in exile. Reconciling a former Cromwellian like Broghill with Charles II was a delicate business, and it took some time. And Cork's role in smoothing a path seems to have been very important in this. In the middle of April, the Earl wrote to my brother Shannon into Holland, and a few days later noted, I did give my brother Broghill notice of his affairs. Again, a, a sparse entry, but a very pregnant one. On the 1st of May, when Parliament voted to receive approaches from the King, Cork did give my brother Broghill notice of this excellent news, and ten days later he was able to forward a commission from the King for Broghill to be the Lord, new Lord President of Munster. Even that honour was not a sure sign of royal approval. In the weeks after the restoration, Cork and Shannon made every effort to bring the new king around. In August, he at last agreed to receive Broghill, and a month later, he made him Earl of Orrery. The hard work had paid off. Now, to conclude. In fact, the return of Charles II marked the high point of cooperation within the Boyle family. Thereafter... The need to act together, forced by war and political crisis, was much less pressing. The political cooperation between the Boyle brothers, which had always, always been fraught, did not last for very long. The new Earl of Orrery became a leading figure in Restoration Ireland, championing the Protestant interest, commanding a phalanx of MPs in the Irish Parliament of 1661, and he was preoccupied with the security of Munster from internal and external threats, reviving the Protestant militia schemes of his father, and building Fort, uh, Charles Fort outside Kinsale. Obviously, Kinsale needed to have an eye on it, just as any uh, invaders from outside did. And he was also involved in plots that eventually brought down the Lord Lieutenant, the Duke of Ormond, in 1669. Lord Cork, by contrast, spent much of his time in England, where he was part of the circle about, around the Roman Catholic Queen Mother, and, interest, and increasingly that of the Duke of York, obviously later James II. He hosted the King and Queen and other members of the family at his London house in 1664, and when he was given an English peerage, it was as Earl of Burlington in 1665. He chose the title because Burlington, otherwise known as Bridlington, was where Henrietta Maria, the Queen Mother, had come to England in 1643 with arms and troops to assist her father. So it was very much a compliment to her.
that he chose the title Burlington. The new Lord Burlington remained as loyal as he could to the Duke of York up to and including the latter's coronation as King James II. Burlington became a distant figure in Ireland. As the century wore on, and unlike his father, he either could not or would not control his extended family. Even his son and heir, Lord Clifford, rebelled in the 1670s, rejecting Burlington's courtly loyalties and becoming known as a patriot who supported the opposition in England. This political disunity among the family was certainly not what the great Earl would have wanted. The late 1670s saw family cohesion under further stress. Lord Orrery died in 1679, a bitter and disillusioned old campaigner. He was buried in the family vault at Yore. Picture that. Oh, no, not that one. That's it, a more modest affair erected by the Great Earl. <coughs> he was predeceased by his younger sister Mary, now Countess of Warwick, who was buried at Felstead Church near her husband's house at Lees in Essex. Interestingly, the reaction of the surviving siblings was to close ranks. Lady Ranelagh was in later years said to wield an unwholesome influence over her elder brother, despite their very different political views. And when in London, Burlington frequently spent the evening with her and with Robert Boyle. It was telling that the closeness of the relationship between this latter pair that Lady Ranelagh died in the same week as Robert Boyle in 1691 and they were buried side by side in St Martin in the Fields, Westminster. Burlington's response to their deaths was inconsolable grief. He himself died a few years later in 1698 and was buried at Lonsborough in Yorkshire. Just... Just finishing. The great Earl of Cork would have had mixed feelings about the behaviour of his children in the de decades after his death. Faced with ongoing wars in Ireland and England, the siblings had divided politically without referring to their elder brother as head of the family. Indeed, when Broghill had sided with Parliament in 1644, he visited Bandon and Lismore and stripped his brother's che treasure chest without a second thought. With the second Earl of Cork in Oxford... And then in France, there was no resident head of the family in any case, and that role was assumed by Broghill, supported by Lady Ranler and Robert Boyle. Ironically, it was this existential threat to the family during the 1650s that drew the Boyles back together. And the Cromwellian period, as it was illuminated by Lord Cork's diary, was a time of reconstruction, mutual assistance, good company, and even political cooperation at last. Broghill saved Cork's estates in Ireland, and a decade later, Cork... Re reciprocated by reconciling Broghill to the Stuart monarchy. It was a remarkable period in which the Boyles certainly acted as a team to their mutual benefit. Their father would have been proud. But after the Restoration, these centripetal forces were no longer there, and the underlying differences became more pronounced. Orrery may have been obsessed with Protestant Ireland and the need to keep the Catholics down, but Burlington was sufficiently relaxed to cultivate key Catholics at court, even the Queen Mother and the Duke of York. Geography also played its part, of all the children, only Orrery spent most of his time in Ireland in the 1660s and 70s. Robert Boyle was busy with his scientific stuff and nurturing the fledgling royal society. Burlington alternated between the royal court and his Yorkshire estates. Lady Ranelagh was content with her sophisticated London circle. The burial sites of the siblings underline this physical separation. Only Orrery was buried in Ireland. And none of them... No, I think, think none of the children, apart from, ah, no, because there was Sarah, Lady Digby, she was, was buried in that ridiculous tomb in St. Patrick's Cathedral. For all his strictures, the great Earl could not ensure that his children were respective, kind and loving towards each other for the rest of their lives, although it is revealing that he thought he could. But it is surely a testament to his forceful personality that the Boyle siblings stuck together as long as they did. For the two decades after the old man's death were those that ensured the immediate survival and the long-term prosperity of the Boyle dynasty. Thank you. Patrick, thank you, thank you so much. Um, a fascinating... Uh, discussion of kind of one family's journey through the 17th century, uh, just taking all that history and the family relationships at the same time. It, there's a reason that Who Do You Think You Are is so popular, and I think we had a little bit of that now, and I mean that as a most huge compliment. It was um, fascinating. So there must be some questions from the floor. Yes, one question. Um, after the restoration, uh, Ormond come back to the Yep. How did not at all, I think it's the short answer. 
Um, well, I mean, one thing I, I, I didn't say is that um, they had Lord's Justices that, who, who took over the Vice Regal job immediately after the, the restoration. It was, um, it was uh, I mean, Boghill was one of them. And, of course, uh, Ormond coming back for another stint as, as Lord Lieutenant meant that he was thrown out of a uh, uh, position of influence and as Lord President of Munster he was very much a, you know, an underling. So I think he concentrated on building up his, his power in Munster and, and working against Ormond and he was one of the ones who engineered Ormond's sacking in 1669. Of course Ormond came back because uh, you can't keep good Ormond down and uh, he's so I think that's why in the 1670s really, I mean under successive um, I think Brooker really wanted the top job so he wasn't very happy but I suppose I mean, his father as Lord Deputy he didn't get the top job either so, but I think in, in character they're more, the, more similar than uh, the first and second earls were I would think I, I hope that helps Oh, it's still with you. It's just in another form. I mean, because I, it was um, one of the Earls of Cork, or the Earl of, of Burlington, rather, he um, only had a daughter who married the Duke of Devonshire. That's why the Devonshires have Lismore Castle now. I mean, they don't have the estate, so I assume that's sort of late 19th century um, still reallocation of lands, but um, certainly there's a presence here. And the, all the papers that we're talking about are Lismore papers. There, there were in Lismore Castle. And uh, a lot of them in the National Library. And the really interesting ones were, were in Chatsworth. Mrs. Boyle? The original Mrs. Boyle. Well, there were two of them. Um, well, the second one. David, do you want to? Um, the first earl, the great earl, married twice. Okay. And the first wife is really interesting. Um, her name is Joan Apsley. You think, ah, English. Mm, no. Uh, her father's English. Her mother was Gaelic Irish. And she was, ra she was raised in Limerick um, in the 1570s. And she was a devout Catholic. Devout Catholic. Uh, she died in 1599 in childbirth. Now, I always wonder what would have happened if she stayed alive, because with a devout Catholic mother and a, a, um, a wife and a, de a, a very devout Catholic mother-in-law, Annabelle de Brune, who was from Kerry, Boyle's family may have followed a very different course, and more like a lot of the English who arrive in Ireland supposedly as Protestants and actually end up, through marrying native women, going Catholic. And then, who knows what, what would have happened in 1641? Yeah. So, Joan Apsley dying in 1599 changes the course of the uh, basically a royal family history. In 1603, after the war is over, Richard Boyle for, um, marries his second wife, Catherine Fenton. And she is the daughter of Sir Geoffrey Fenton, who is one of the leading Protestant ideologues in the Elizabethan state. So, Boyle plugs straight into the sort of Protestant mainstream of the government. And after that, he's able to present himself, whenever he had to, as at the forefront, in the vanguard of Protestantism. There's two wives, and it, the 15 children are by Catherine Fenton. Yeah, 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 the second one. Yeah, she died in childbirth, yeah. So. There are words you've mentioned. Right, thank you so much everyone. So the next thing to happen here is the screening of a film um, on Tost Fada. So we're just going to take a moment to set that up and uh, you're very welcome to disperse and to come back for 12. So thanks everyone.